the gear you actually need versus the gear you really want. Hi guys, and welcome back to the Bird Photography Show. Now, whether it's the gear you need or the gear you want, the place to get that gear is definitely Camera Canada. Thank you so much for sponsoring this episode, Camera Canada. And if you guys are in the market for some new gear, check them out. Use the code BIRDPHOTOSHOW when you order from Camera Canada, and the guys over there will definitely look after you. Glenn, the other day I tried to convince you to buy an RF 1.4 extender for your 100 to 500 millimeter lens for your upcoming Antarctica trip because you're not taking your big lens and I wanted you to have a little bit more reach, but you refused. Because I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, sometimes I feel like in the field, I want the minimal kit possible. I don't like to buy equipment for specific scenarios. Like I might need it for this trip, but then I won't need it again. And I, you, you do have a point, but for the time being, I don't really want to spend the money on those converters if I'm probably then not going to use them for many years from now. Fair enough. I must say I like using the 1.4 extender on the 100 from 500 from time to time. It gives pretty good results, but what about a backup body for a place like Antarctica, Glenn? Once again, <laughs> I, I will fully admit here, my frugality is I'm flirting with disaster here because I, I have not bought a second R5 or another R body. I am taking my trusty old 7D2 as my backup and really hoping that nothing goes wrong with my main camera. I still will have a backup, but I would not be that happy to have to use it on this trip. It's just tricky right now because, you know, there's these rumors of the R5 II coming out. I don't really want to buy another R5 that then is just going to be relegated to have to sell it. So I'm just sort of stuck in not wanting to buy another camera at this point. As you say, you're flirting with disaster, going to all these remote places with just one great camera, especially because you're having 100 to 500 now as well. So if that one breaks down, you can't even use your backup on that lens. So it's definitely tricky, but I totally understand the whole thing with the backup cameras because I never used to have one. Now because I do YouTube, I have a lot more gear because I film myself here, I have all these other camera bodies. But in the past, I also never really had a backup body. Basically, it feels like wasted money until you actually need it. It's kind of like having insurance, but when you actually need a second body and you're in an awesome place and don't have it, it's pretty annoying. And now you're overcompensating and have all of the cameras. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay. So what about this though? Have you ever bought something and then felt like you used it once and then just never used it again? I've bought a few lenses like that in the past and I sold them pretty quickly. As you say, I feel like I have one of each kind of at the moment, especially when it comes to camera bodies, but mainly because I do YouTube. When you do a lot of camera reviews, you always want to be able to compare mm -hmm. the different bodies. My R3 that's filming me right now, it's a pretty expensive camera. If I wasn't doing YouTube, that would probably be one camera that I would have to think two or three times whether it's worth the investment. Let's bring it back to what we need. You know, as a bird photographer, Jan, what do you think the budget bird photographer, the person who's just getting started into bird photography, what do they need? I think these days it's a lot more affordable than ever to get a lens that gets you to 600 millimeters. In the past, people always said get a lens that gets you at least to 400 millimeters because there was a lot mm -hmm. less options available. I would say try to get to 600 millimeters because there's a lot of affordable options now. We have the Nikon 180 to 600, Sony 200 to 600. We have the Canon 100 to 500. There isn't really a cheap 600 option, but there may be something else coming soon. We heard rumors about the 200 to 800 mm -hmm. maybe. So I think these lenses sort of in the sub $2,000 category would be something I go to if your budget allows you because that will really get you into the bird photography game. If it's less than 600 millimeters or less than 500 millimeters, especially, I think it's becoming a little bit tricky to get those small birds large enough in the frame, yeah, isn't it? Definitely. And you can always, of course, resort to one, one of the crop bodies like the R7. 600 is kind of the magic threshold. You need to get out over that effective focal length to be able to start kind of having fun and having good results and enjoying yourself. The easiest way to do that would be with either an off-brand zoom or some kind of zoom if, if your manufacturer has one and a decent camera body, and then you can have a great time out there. These days, Glenn and I would definitely recommend a mirrorless camera 
camera with the modern autofocusing, the eye tracking, because it makes it much easier for you in the field to get great photos. But if you're on a real tight budget, a camera like a 7D and like a 100 to 400 millimeter lens will also get you over those 600 millimeters and can be a great starting point that's relatively cost effective. And even the third party lenses like a Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter lens actually work really well on those DSLR cameras. So that could also be a fantastic way to get into the game without spending too much. Absolutely. Now, Jan, what about for the sort of intermediate, uh, someone who's been taking pictures of birds for a few years and now they kind of want to upgrade their kit. What do you think they need? In the mid range, I would definitely recommend if you're still on a DSLR camera to go to mirrorless camera because like the for step sure. from like a 5D Mark IV or 7D Mark II to an R5 is just mind blowing really. Or even like an R7, yeah. all these cameras will give you a lot more keepers in the field, will allow you to shoot in a lot darker conditions, have better autofocus and get better results ultimately. And if it's in the budget, you might also be looking at like a secondhand prime lens, maybe a 500 version two or 600 version two that has come down a lot in price. So if you really want to have, see a change in your images, the biggest step would probably going from a cheaper zoom lens to a prime lens because you get much different looking backgrounds. You'll get much more details and sharpness and if it's in the budget, I'd probably go for that. Ultimately, in the mid range, we'd recommend to find something that suits your budget, would be a mirrorless camera with the best lens you can afford pretty much. But what about those lenses that we really want, like we said at the beginning of the show, and if you're a professional bird photographer or want to get there or the budget isn't as tight, what do you would recommend then? Yeah, I mean, I think once you get really serious about the hobby and if you have the means, ultimately the gear you want as a bird photographer is a big super telephoto lens. It's not just the reach, right? like somebody, if you didn't know anything about photography, you might be like, well, what, this, this, you know, 200 to 600 costs this much and weighs this much, why would I get this? But of course you have more light coming in, you get a nicer, smoother background, you get better, faster autofocus. So it does bring quite a bit to the table, but it also comes with, you might have to upgrade your tripod. You might need a different gimbal head for it. You've got to carry it around in the field. And so there is a slippery slope there in that sort of upper element. But if we're just talking about the dream bird photography kit, of course, you want a, a, the best mirrorless body that your brand offers and a big super telephoto lens and all the accessories that come with it. And then there's actually one company at the moment that allows us to be a bit of a tweener, which would be Nikon that brings out amazing lenses like an 806.3 PF or the very new 606.3 PF that weighs hardly anything that kind of gets your pro lens in like a mid range budget, which can also be a fantastic option. You know, Canon had that 405.6 and it was so light. It didn't have image stabilization though. And I was always wondering, you know, if they would make a 505.6 or a 600 five, six or six, three, it could be such a useful in-between step because that's the real thing there. The mid-range, we kind of want to recommend a different lens in all the brands, but there's not really one. Whereas Nikon, there is with those PF lenses, like that 600 PF, that's definitely a great call. That would be a fantastic stepping stone. And then you could decide whether you even need a 600 F4. In the end, it's not fun to drag a 600 F4 around with you in the field, is it? <laughs> no. And I think that that is going to be the future where we see these lighter lenses and these more zoom lenses with higher megapixel bodies that allow different crop modes so that we potentially don't need those, those um, 600 F4s anymore. Is there things you still feel like is sort of lacking from the lineup, especially Canon might, if you look at that lineup might be a little bit different to what Nikon offers at the moment. Is there things that you feel like you still want and need? With Canon right now, they've got a very fast, good sensor body, the R3, but it doesn't have enough megapixels. The R5 is an amazing camera, but it doesn't have a stacked sensor. So we just need to fix that. <laughs> what about Nikon? I think what most of our users would want to see is a crop body, like a D500, a mirrorless version of a D500, something like a bit of a better R7, so to speak. And yeah. we also need a cheaper full frame camera. We have all these amazing cheap and light lenses. But then the best camera to start with would be a Z8 or Z9, which then brings the whole combo close to that $10,000 mark, which is a lot for most people and probably not something a for lot sure. of people want to spend on the gear. So cheaper bodies that get you great results with good autofocusing is really what's missing in a Nikon lineup. But when it comes to the lenses, 
I don't think there's no comparison. And for wildlife photography, I don't think they need to add too much because we've basically covered every base three times. Yeah, Nikon is winning the lens war for sure. Now, Sony's kind of interesting because for a while now, they've, you know, they have a fantastic 600. They've got a great uh, zoom with the 200 to 600, but they, the bodies tend to be quite expensive. So, you know, the A1 is not really approachable for most people. I think from Sony, there's definitely an A9 Mark III coming pretty soon, which is probably the first camera of the new generation. So it'll be interesting to see what that camera can do because people say it might do 40, 50, 60 frames per second, anywhere between mm -hmm. like 30 and 50 megapixels. So it would be a pretty amazing camera by the sounds of it, it would be a direct competitor either to the R3 or future R5 Mark II. So it's pretty interesting what Sony's doing, even though I must admit it feels a little bit they've kind of been resting on their Waiting. sort of past success because they were the first in the game that made amazing lenses. But for instance, for wildlife photography, there hasn't been a lens in years coming out. And they have some really great cameras, but a lot of them are relatively slow, like an A7R4, A7R5 only does 10 frames per second, which was a lot in the past, but kind of feels a little bit slow. And a lot of their cheaper bodies have a lot of rolling shutter, for instance. So I feel like there's definitely room for one or two cameras for us wildlife photographers as well. And I'm sure there will be another one coming out soon. It's going to get exciting next year because it seems like it's always those Olympics years. It's the Summer Olympics in Paris next year. And I'm sure we're going to see a new A1. I'm sure we're going to see the R1 and probably something else from Nikon, I would think. So all of these things we've been wanting, they're coming. We'll just have to see exactly how they manifest themselves. So better put some money aside, hey? Especially yeah, you. <laughs> start saving up. Yeah, I'll start saving up. Okay. <laughs> At the end of the day, Equipment does matter, but it's not the most important thing. What is the most important thing is to get out there in the field, learn about your subjects and have fun taking pictures of birds. Do you know what else is very important, especially if you might have not the most high end equipment is editing so that you actually know how to get the most out of your photos. Because oftentimes people think my gear isn't good or the images don't look quite right. But if they learned all the necessary skills mm -hmm. and like Photoshop used our pro sets, for instance, they could get so much more out of their photos, no matter with what equipment it was taken. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it, you have to do a bit of everything. You need to learn about the subjects, you need to have a certain level of gear, and you have to learn how to edit your photos. So if you want to learn how to improve your skills in the digital darkroom, be sure to check out Jan's masterclass and my ebook down in the description. And you probably want to check out our pro sets and our brand new brush pack as well while you're at it. But enough of that now. What's the first image you brought us this week? I've brought this beautiful little um, painted bush quail. And this is by Dijvijay Chaugle. And what I like about this image Glenn, Glenn, is Glenn, 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 that Glenn. Glenn, you forgot to mention where it was taken. India. So what I like <laughs> about this image, you know, it's got this really nice gradiated background. The bird is in a nice pose. He's got a nice kind of look about him. And it's got some nice, you know, the red feet and the red bill. I just think it's a, a, a great portrait of this species. What do you think, Jan? I think it's a beautiful image. I really like it. I do like your transition in the background as well. I wonder if it was my photo, if I felt like I would just lighten the very top of the image a little bit. Mm. So the background doesn't feel so heavy, like it's almost pushing down on the bird a little bit. It's really nice and bright at the bottom and then goes fairly dark. So I wonder if I would kind of reverse the gradient on the green bit slightly. And I think other than that, it's pretty much perfect. This Two things, if you were really nitpicky, you could work on. I think it has a pretty strong reflection in the eye. So you could slightly work on the eye with a couple layers from our brush pack, like darken the actual black bit in the eye mm -hmm. and maybe color up the surrounding of the eye a little bit. And then if you're super picky, I don't know, you sometimes do that as well. And I think there's those few feathers sticking up in the neck. Do they actually bother mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Is that something you might work on or not? Well, you could do this. You might want to do this. These are things you could consider. And when you guys are editing your images, and you're, you've done your kind of global adjustments and then you get to a certain point, these are the questions you should be asking yourselves. Is there anything I want to remove? You scan around the image. Is there anything that could be enhanced that will still look nice and natural? Are there things that I could do, little things that could make this image better? But this is also why we say that you need to have a plan when you're editing because you can see mm -hmm. how can, you can easily get lost in an image like this. I'm like, should I do yep. this? Should I do that? Should I do that? 
in the end, I feel like if it feels like it's too much, you should probably not do it at all. So you just probably leave stop. it as it is because it's an awesome looking image. And sometimes we just like to give you little ideas or hints of what could be done. Doesn't mean we would do it on every image, but I think it's always important to know what can be done and how to do it. So if you need to do it, you actually be able to do it. You have the options for sure. All right, Jan, what's your first image this week? My next image seems like it was taken right outside your door, Glenn, on Vancouver Island by Durant Stefan Photo. And it's this awesome flight shot of this Stella J. And I pretty much like everything about this photo. I think it's a fantastic flight pose. It's an amazing head turn. And mm -hmm. let's play this game again. There's just one thing I'm not entirely sure about in this photo. So let's just see what you think. Well, I agree. It's a great shot. It's a it's one that everybody would be happy to have in their portfolio of the bird launching off. And these are the kind of images that the new mirrorless autofocus technology, you're seeing more and more of this types of images yep. because you have those fast frame rates and you have the eye tracking. So you're definitely starting to see, you know, whether it's on Instagram or Flickr or wherever you look at photos, you're seeing more quality shots like this. So uh, this photographer did a great job capturing the action, having a fast enough shutter speed so that the wings, um, and I don't know what camera was used, but there's not a lot of perceivable rolling shutter that I'm no. seeing. So I don't know exactly what you're going for, Jan, here, but maybe adding some mid-tone contrast to the blacks on the back of the bird. And for me, when I was looking at it, there's a couple of very nitpicky things, which is there's like some little dust speck behind the bird's tail and also kind of like a white splotch on the tail. And for me, I felt like the, the bird's head could be actually sharpened a little bit better. So those were the three things that jumped out to me. But were those, was that what you were on about, Jan? Not exactly, but I agree. Looking at it now, I'd grab one of our brush layers, adjustment layers, and definitely brush it back more, a bit more black into the bird. Could probably even add a little bit of saturation on the wings and the back as well. And the one thing I was referring to when I was found looking at this image initially is how do I feel about the bird being connected to the branch in a few spots? I didn't really have a solution to it, and I still don't really know what I think about it. But when I look at it, I can't sort of stop wondering what it would be like if it was a little bit less connected, especially sort of around the tail feathers. So again, this could be something that you think, oh my God, what's he talking about? He always wants to clone something. But at the same time, it could also be something that improves the image. So I wonder what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I see what you're saying. Um, and I think in this case of the three connection points, if, 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 you were going to remove one of them, it would be the one with the tail because yeah. the bird could have easily launched off from that middle sprig yeah. of the um, Douglas fir tree here. And if you were going to remove one, that would be the one. And I think it wouldn't affect the image, but it's, yeah, that's real personal preference -y type things. But anyways, a great shot by Stefan Durand. All right, so my second image this week is by Vins Pasqua, and it's of this beautiful species, this indigo banded kingfisher. I'm super, I would love to see this bird. This is such a little beauty. It's so cute. It looks like he's got a heart on his actual heart, which is crazy, <laughs> and these stunning different shades of blue, those, that red bill. It's such a beautiful bird. But yeah, there's something, <laughs> there's something about the image that I wouldn't be super stoked about in a perfect world. What do you think that might be? It's an amazing image of an amazing bird, and that's what makes the image. If this was any other yes. bird that wouldn't look this ridiculously amazing, you'd be very challenged by this photo because obviously there's a lot of challenges, especially in the background. First of all, it's this kind of little bit brown, muddy color. Then you have this thick branch pipe. I don't know what it is, maybe a bamboo kind of thing or root going through the background, which is definitely challenging. And then even the position of the perch is always difficult if it kind of comes out of the frame, goes through the bird and then continues behind the bird. So I don't know, there's probably not too much you can do about this image here. You could probably select a bird and just maybe lighten the background a little bit, even paint over the background a little bit to lessen the impact of it. But the bird's so amazing that you can get away with it in this case. So I probably wouldn't do too yeah. much, but the background's definitely a challenge. And I think this is one, and who knows, this situation might have been the bird flew in and poof, it was gone. But this is one of those ones where in the field, you really need to be thinking about, if, if this bird was pretty chill and was just sitting there, maybe you could have gotten a little bit lower and shot up into some more foliage or, or you know, I doubt you'd be able to move around freely. You'd flush the bird. Maybe you were even in a boat here, but... 
the bank, it looks to me like there's like a river bank and the bird yeah. was out on a little perch. So the background is kind of closer than you'd ideally want it to be. And of course, you've got that thing running horizontally right through the bird. So when you're in the field, because we're always talking about editing, but when you're in the field and you have this special moment right in front of you with this stunning little bird, you need to be thinking about those things. And sometimes you can do something about them, sometimes you can't. But very often, like maybe he was in a boat and could have just like kind of moved a little bit back further and like got a different angle to shoot into some like nicer foliage or changed your perspective slightly to get a better background. It's just something to consider, but what a cool bird I would love to see one day. So great shot. I actually had the exact same Kingfisher example many years ago where I was shooting parallel to the bank. I had a very busy background, but then positioning myself further down on the river shooting along the river gave me much smoother, much cleaner background, which might not be possible here. So awesome image. But if you can, like if that bird comes to the same spot a lot, somehow positioning yourself more to the left or the right kind of around it with a more distant background would definitely be the way to go. And one more thing just before we move on is we were talking earlier in this episode about the gear we want and why would you want to have a 600 f4 with that big aperture well it's in these types of scenarios when you really want to resolve that background and blur it out and this might have been taken with 600 i don't know but sometimes it's that difference between yeah. f4 and f5.6 or 6.3 or f8 where if you shot this for example with the 100 to 500 with a teleconverter on it the background would just be a mess you know so that's why you pay the big bucks for those big lenses my next image is by Oliver Tweedy, photo of this barking owl, and I think it's just a really nice photo. It's tricky sort of lighting conditions, the background's pretty bright, but I think it's overall very well balanced. It's pretty nicely edited, so there's probably not too much I would do about it, because it's nice, the eyes are wide and open, the bird's doing a very interesting sort of curious pose, so I just thought it's a very nice image. Yeah, it's a cute pose. I think when you get these, obviously an owl at a day roost, um, and it's giving that kind of curious little little pose, so that's quite nice. Um, you know, obviously there's some leaves touching it and things like that, that. But if you took all those out, it would almost be too sterile. It would almost look mm. like it was taken at just like a raptor center or something like that. So I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's a really nice, a really nice portrait. All right, so my final image this week is of this beautiful little blue tit by Ali Ali Islam. So I'm assuming this is a setup at a feeder, um, mm. and it's a really nice perch selection. And to give a little even more credit is that there's those nice sort of secondary elements of leaves coming in. It's always tricky when you're selecting perches to do a setup to find small or appropriately sized foliage to match the bird. This is a small bird and you'd have to find a branch with very small leaves. And they've done an excellent job of setting up this perch that I think looks really nice. I think it's a great image. I feel like they tried to keep the leaves in on the left, which ended up kind of not fully balancing the crop because you probably want a little bit less on the left and a bit more space in front of the bird in an ideal world. But I think other than that, it's really nicely done. Kind of tricky lighting situation, handled very well as well. Very bright background, but it matches the leaves. looks really nice. And then ironically, I would try to maybe make the blue tit a tiny bit less blue. It feels like it has a little <laughs> bit of a blue cast when you sort of Look at the head and the whites in the bird. Like it feels like it has an ever so slight blue cast on mine. Just warm up that bird a little bit because also the yellow on the belly feels kind of blue or very sort of colorless. I mean, there's endless amounts of subspecies of blue tits as well. So maybe this mm. is one It's more sort of further south. So it might look very different to the ones that I was used to in Germany. But overall, I think a fantastic image where I wouldn't really do much. Maybe just recrop it slightly to have a bit more space in front of the bird. My last image is of this awesome looking yellow-headed blackbird taken in somewhat tricky lighting conditions. Look at it, it has a pretty bright throat, bright background. Bird might be slightly in shade. The cattail definitely looks like it's in shade. So I thought overall very well handled and definitely a nice situation because they are not the easiest birds to photograph, are they? Well, they, they actually can be fairly straightforward. If you find a little marsh, I know on my road trip back a couple springs ago, when you're covering ground, you find the right scenario. And these guys will definitely, they love to post up on cattails. So you just have to find the right situation, which this photographer did. And I think, as you say, they've done a nice job. What's nice about this image is you've got the nice perch, that splash of green kind of coming through, but not getting in the way. Mm. And 
an overall kind of pleasing image. The one thing I will say, so you'd have to decide about that sort of like orange line going through the background, which yeah. I don't really mind. It's just another cattail that's out of like way out of focus in the background. So it doesn't bother me. Yeah. But one thing I would say is that overall, I what I think happened here is this image I think should be a little bit brighter overall. But I think that in the editing process, the photographer started seeing that those yellows on the throat, if they brightened the overall image, it was going to get too bright. And so that's why they stopped. But really what we would want to do is keep going and then mask that back out and be able to hold on to those yellows. So I think a little bit of selective editing. I could be wrong. Maybe this was exactly how they wanted to present it. But for me, I think I would make the overall image, the you know the blacks, the background, and the, the cattail and the greens brighter and then just hold on to the yellows by using a little bit of layer masking. Although in this case, if you brighten the background, you'd probably blow it out as well. So one trick you could do is True. pull some saturation out of it because that will stop it from blowing out as well. I actually remember running around some swamp in Vancouver trying to photograph these birds, but they would never come close enough, just kind of sit in the middle of the swamp. So I was never getting any shot. Maybe that's why I thought that's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, like most things, you got to find the right spot. So it's I feel like more often than not with birds, it's about finding the right location with the right bird, and that's when you get your best opportunities. And that's what's so fun about like stuff like the photo of the week is we see these beautiful birds, that amazing kingfisher, and this hawk, and this and owl. And it's somebody who had a great moment. It's somebody who had yeah. a great opportunity put in front of them, and then we get to share them and talk about them on the show. So that's awesome. But for this episode, I think we're done talking. So we want to thank you guys for watching. Make sure you like the video and subscribe. And we will see you in the next one. And also let us know all your thoughts in the comments. Bye. See you next time, guys.